incredibly fortunate to have an all-star lineup of speakers today. And our first keynote speaker, Todd Stern, is really a great way to begin the conversation. Um, he has, as Sheldon said, a distinguished career contributing to significant policy at the White House, at Treasury, at State, at the Center for American Progress, and now at Brookings Institute. But in this room, he's probably best known as the Special Envoy for Climate Change who led the U.S. negotiations on climate for the seven years leading up to the Paris Agreement. Um, I hope that you will all welcome him, and on behalf of, I can't speak for everyone here, but on behalf of Governor Raimondo's energy and environment team, we're still in, in Rhode Island. So, welcome, Todd. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having me here. It's a uh, great pleasure. Uh, it's actually my third time in Providence this year, so I'm getting to be kind of a regular. Um, I applaud the work of this conference uh, this year. I mean, it's important every year, given the issues that, uh, that we face and the issues that you focus on, but more so now than ever, given uh, this administration's uh, clear, uh, uh, manifested intention to roll back most everything uh, with respect to environmental protection. Uh, also, so pleased to be here with uh, Senator Whitehouse. Uh, he is, I think you all know, but I can tell you uh, without any question, he is the conscience of the Senate uh, on this issue, and we should all be grateful for his constant leadership uh, and tenacity. Now, I'm going to try to talk for about 15 minutes or so and then uh, open the floor to questions. Uh, I'll see if I can stick to that, uh, and I'll give a little bit of brief back background and then um, talk mostly about where we stand uh, on climate change uh, in the Trump era. Uh, first, I think we uh, all recognize, I don't think I have to spend a lot of time uh, on the fact that uh, climate change is a huge uh, and growing challenge uh, and threat. You can uh, look at the evidence uh, all around us. We seem to have 100-year events every other year. Uh, here all over this country and, uh, and all over every part of the world. Uh, to combat climate change, the fundamental thing we need to do uh, is to hasten the global transition from high to very low and then eventually no carbon uh, energy base. Uh, important things to do with respect to uh, forests and lands, but, uh, but energy is, uh, is front and center. Um, and to do this, we also need an international regime, and that's because climate change is one of those quintessentially global problems. It's not like most environmental problems where you can clean up your, uh, your water, you can clean up uh, your air in terms of conventional pollution uh, on a local basis. You can't do that on climate change. The CO2 that goes up in the air anywhere covers the entire globe. Uh, and countries won't act unless they are uh, confident that their partners and competitors are also acting. So you need a, a, a global regime. Uh, there was probably some 20 years or so spent trying to get there, and we finally did get there with Paris. Paris really does set up that global regime. We got there with extraordinary leadership, both from uh, President Obama, from Secretary Kerry, and so many others uh, in our administration. Uh, I'm not going to spend a long time on Paris. I'll, I'll take through a, a few quick points. I'm happy to, to uh, talk about more uh, in Q&A. But Paris was historic and very different from the failed efforts uh, that had gone before it uh, for those nearly 20 years, and it really represented a paradigm shift. At first, it was, it's a universal agreement. It applies to all countries, which is absolutely not the way the, the main predecessor agreement, the Kyoto Protocol, was, which applied only to one set of countries, the developed countries. Uh, it's, it has a, a nationally determined kind of bottom-up structure, which uh, was the only way that you could conceive of, uh, of, uh, of a structure that would bring all countries uh, of the world in, and all countries of the world in, in the sense that they are themselves acting. Uh, it is strong, it has strong ambition. Uh, a good start with respect to country targets, not the, not the best that you could hope for, but, uh, well, probably the best you could hope for, maybe not the best that you would wish, but a good start uh, in terms of the actual first targets. But even more important, strong goals going forward, a five-year repeating cycles where countries have to keep enhancing uh, the, um, the targets that they put forward, uh, and also a strong system of transparency, of reporting and review, so everybody can see what everybody else is doing. 
Uh, it has a forward-looking uh, means of, of, uh, different, of uh, creating differentiation between developed and developing countries, as opposed to the kind of old-fashioned firewall, which completely separated them in a way that really wasn't tenable, uh, either substantively or politically going forward. Uh, it has a hybrid legal form. Some things in it are legally binding, some things are not. Uh, that was uh, necessary for bringing uh, the great, again, the great uh, 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 mass of countries to the table and uh, being able to, to uh, reach agreement. And also, obviously, important uh, for the United States uh, as well. President Obama was able to uh, take us into this agreement as an executive agreement because of the way that we negotiated it. Uh, and there was really broad acclaim for Paris uh, through uh, in countries all over the world, in boardrooms, civil societies, and so forth. Uh, President Obama also uh, did huge things with respect to uh, on the domestic front, the clean power plan, the miles per gallon, the so-called cafe standards, uh, the uh, whole slew of, uh, of uh, energy efficiency standards uh, that uh, DOE uh, put forward, methane regulations for oil and gas and so forth and so forth. And now we have an administration which is, uh, which is uh, pretty systematically trying to roll all of that back. Uh, and in addition to trying to roll back all of those uh, various regulations, uh, they are decimating uh, the budget for scientific research. The head of the EPA uh, doesn't even, uh, won't even concede that, 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 that human activity uh, causes climate change. Uh, and then, of course, we have President uh, Trump's uh, withdrawal or announced intention to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. So the question is, now what do we do? Uh, this is obviously a disappointing time. I can't tell you how many times, particularly in the early days after uh, Trump's um, uh, notable speech on January, uh, June 1st in, uh, in the Rose Garden, how many times I would run into people and they would look at me like they thought maybe they needed to offer condolences. Um, but that's, uh, that is um, obviously not, that, that's not uh, in the order of the day, it's not the way I operate, it's not the way anybody here operates. What we need to do is to fight back and to mobilize and the good news is that there is a huge amount of that uh, with respect to climate change going on around the world. Um, there's large scale mobilization happening uh, with respect to states and cities, civil society. Uh, and uh, I know there's panels gonna, uh, that are coming up today that are gonna talk about some of that as well as energy innovation, but maybe I'll just tick, tick through uh, a few things. There's the we are still in effort. Uh, which started with an extraordinary, within, within days, an extraordinary number of, of states, cities, companies, universities, and so forth, uh, announcing their determination to, to, uh, to continue to abide by Paris. That started with about 1,000. We're now up to something like 2,300. It's, uh, it's a huge effort. Uh, the U.S. Climate Alliance is a group of now 14 states and, and plus Puerto Rico. One of those states is Rhode Island. Uh, it was led in the first instance by California, New York, and Washington State, um, a uh, group of states uh, who are determined to take action to support Paris and to take action uh, at the state level to drive forward on, uh, on reducing emissions and, and uh, driving the energy transition. And this is a group of states that represents 36% of U.S. population, 41% of U.S. GDP, and 24% of U.S. Uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the Climate Mayors is a group of three, over 380 mayors who are, again, uh, committed to the Paris goals, also includes uh, Mayor uh, Lors of, of Providence. Uh, and there, is, uh, there has been leadership at the state and local level now for years. California, Washington State, New York, uh, the, the Northeast states that are part of the, uh, of the Reggie uh, emissions trading effort. Again, Rhode Island is part of that, and Rhode Island has been taking a variety of its own actions uh, at home. Governor Raimondo signed a set of bills just a couple of months ago designed to spur the growth of renewable energy here. Uh, you have the Block Island wind farm that began operating uh, last December, and I believe was the first offshore wind farm uh, in the U.S., and all of this is exactly the kind of thing that we need uh, to keep doing. Uh, there is also an enormous amount of clean energy uh, dynamism going on in the so-called real economy around the world. I'm going to see if I'm actually able to make this work. It's not my strong suit, but 
I'm just going to show you a, a few slides. So you have this dramatic uh, expansion of, uh, of uh, solar uh, PV installations, uh, as you can see, just completely taking off uh, in the years or around 2008 uh, and, and, uh, and going forward. Uh, global wind capacity, kind of the same basic trajectory, you know, flat, 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 and then just exploding. Uh, you have uh, global uh, lithium ion battery market. So this is, uh, you, you see a pretty steady state with respect to small batteries, but then uh, an explosive growth that's just starting. You see this goes out to 2025, but, but you can see it's starting rapidly with respect to vehicles, uh, thanks to people like Elon Musk and others. Uh, and then uh, also uh, a, an enormous growth that is about to happen with respect to energy storage. Uh, okay, I've got to go quick. Um, uh, let me uh, jump ahead, um, just make a, a, a mention a couple of other things. There's, there's uh, huge positive developments with respect to solar in India, uh, in China, uh, and uh, in, in France, the UK, uh, and China have all indicated their intention to move past uh, the internal combustion engine and to rely entirely on electric vehicles. Uh, France and, and uh, UK saying that, uh, intending to do that by 2040. Volvo is going to sell only electric cars starting in 2019 uh, and so forth. So lots of positive action uh, going on. It does not mean that national leadership is unimportant. National leadership does matter uh, at the level of driving policies that make all of this stuff happen faster, the kind of policies that I was talking about earlier uh, from President uh, Obama. Uh, acceleration of the transition is what it's all about. We are basically in a race right now. We have all of this really positive stuff going on uh, that I uh, just was alluding to uh, at the level of, uh, of the uh, energy transformation. But we also have action happening uh, with respect to the impacts of climate change faster, basically uh, faster than, uh, than any of the scientists uh, have been proje projecting. Whatever the projections are, nature seems to be going faster. So you, you basically have a race. Uh, and to get to the below two degree level that scientists have been calling for for a long time that's embedded in the Paris uh, agreement is going to take an enormous uh, amount of, uh, of change, an enormous amount uh, of effort. The, uh, the Obama administration, right before the end, uh, did a, a, a scenario out to 2050. It's something that's called for in the Paris Agreement. And, uh, and just as an example, uh, in that scenario, so we're, we're at 70 percent of our electricity use comes from fossil fuels right now. In that scenario, that's got to go down to 20 percent on the assumption that the 20 percent uh, use of fossil fuels can produce emissions that get captured, captured and buried in so-called carbon capture and storage. If that doesn't work, then you've got to go lower than, than the 20 percent. Um, I will leave you with, do I have time? Who's ever monitoring to, to, to do uh, one more minute? Uh, I want to just uh, uh, make a, a uh, give you one closing thought uh, about, um, about politics. Uh, as a matter of policy, innovation, and finance, we can do all the things, we and the world can do all the things we need to do to make this transition go as fast as it needs to go. We know what we need to do in terms of policy. We have, in the United States, the best innovation infrastructure in the entire world. And as a matter of financing, if you look at reports from places, you know, from, from, from crazy left-wing places like Citibank, they will tell you that it will be cheaper over a 25-year horizon, it will be cheaper, not even counting the, the, the negative uh, impacts of climate change, not even counting that, it will be cheaper to make this transition than not to make this transition. So the issue is, the tough issue is politics. And James Carville famously said uh, in the 1992 campaign for uh, President Clinton, you know, the, 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 um, the buzzword in the, in, that, in the war room in, in Little Rock was it's the economy stupid. With, with respect to climate change, it's sort of, it's the politics stupid. Uh, that's, the thing that, that's the thing that's difficult. And until elected officials understand that they will suffer consequences for not doing what they, what they ought to be doing on climate change, they're going to they're gonna continue to not do the right thing. Uh, I, I think that, the, that we fundamentally have 
uh, a double kind of political challenge. The most important piece is uh, the kind of tribal quality of climate denial, which, which so far has still made climate, up until now and still, made climate change a kind of third rail on, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of the US Congress. Uh, and uh, and the, second, the second political issue I think is less important, but it's still very much there, which is that people, including Democrats, including people in the knowledgeable policy community in places like Washington, get that there's a problem, they don't get the scale and speed at which we need to deal with it. So they get that there's a problem, they don't get the, 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 uh, the, 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 the degree to which we've got we, we've to hit this. And so it's a sort of an assumption of gradualism being okay. And, and need, both of these things are real political problems. I'm not gonna solve the political problem right now, I, and uh, I couldn't even if you gave me more time. But, uh, but, it, but it's a major one, and I guess the one thing that I am quite uh, persuaded about at this point is that that um, that the that particularly with that first that what I might call the tribal problem, the messengers are going to be more important than the message, uh, and that that's something we're all going to need to work on. So I will stop here. I have a feeling I took up all the time for questions, but no. Oh, there's time for questions. Okay, um, so I'm open. To <laughs> I'm open to questions if anybody wants to ask a question. Yeah. How do you think that the. Uh, Hi. Good morning. Thank you for the, sure. the remarks. Um, how do you think that the groups like the We're Still In and the U.S. Climate Alliance are perceived by others in the international community? Other countries that are yeah. Uh, I so my feeling is that, um, that 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 they will be received in a very positive way. I think it's. I mean, as soon as as soon as it was clear what Trump was going to do, uh, I felt, and I think the the reason we are still in was born so quickly is that many people felt that it's uh, enormously important to demonstrate both within the United States that there is a powerful constituency to continue to move forward, but also to demonstrate that internationally. And uh, you know, I think that, that the basic international sense of the United States in the period uh, between 2001 and 2008 and during the Bush years was basically one of quiescence. The, 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 uh, the Bush administration was not engaged very much in trying to move forward on, uh, on uh, climate change negotiations, it was not engaged very much on trying to move forward on those kinds of policies uh, inside the U.S. And it's enormously important that people see that Washington may have gone dark, but America has not gone dark. And in large parts of America, there's action, there's commitment, there's drive, and uh, so I think that these kinds of efforts are hugely important. It's also important to drive emissions lower than they would have been otherwise. So, those, so, that, so that in that concrete way, that's also important. But I think the message to the international community will be very, very well received, and it's hugely important. Oh, I think we. Have, I'm sorry. I think we have somebody in the back right there. Last I heard, RPE wasn't even a line item in the budget. And they're a young agency that really is right on the cusp of technology transfer for all the science ingenuity they've come up with. Is there any advice for how we can parlay that um, science? Uh, look, I, uh, I, I don't have, uh, I don't have uh, legislative tactical advice, um, but uh, I think ARPA-E is, is, uh, is a hugely important and, uh, and, and to date, as you say, young but very successful uh, organization, you know, modeled on DARPA, the, the, the Defense uh, Research Agency. Uh, and uh, it's crazy, I mean, it's crazy in so many ways, but to, to, to be pulling back uh, on, uh, on the kind of R&D that can build our economy. I mean, if you, didn't even worry, if you didn't even believe in climate change at all, you, 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 you look and say, this is where the world is going economically. Look at the, look at the, um, the, the, the unbelievable 
I guess I, guess I didn't get to the slides because I was rushing on, on the cost reductions, but if, if the curves of, of use are going that way, the curves and costs are going just the, the exact opposite direction. I mean, the costs, the, the reason that India has canceled 14 gigawatts of, uh, of coal plants, so, so a gigawatt is 1,000 megawatts, 500 megawatts is a great big honking coal facility. That's what 500 is. So that's, that's equivalent of canceling 28 big time coal plants. And the reason is because a coal is more expensive than solar there now. Right, so it's crazy to, to, to cut, but I mean, so we'll, 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 we need to talk to uh, the senator and, uh, and others about the specific tactics, but, but that's an agency that should survive. Uh, I think that was the next, next one. Coming back to the question of politics in Washington, how are the politics around the issue of adaptation evolving? And I'm thinking about this from the point of view of both federal agency um, practices, policies, within agencies like DOD, Army Corps, et cetera, and also as it relates to um, issues like federal flood insurance, um, you know, other public policies that flow down to the states. Yeah, well, you know, I think that, um, that with respect to adaptation, I mean, my observation in the, you know, in the seven and a half years that, that I was in the Obama administration is that, uh, that Everything having to do with what federal agencies do is greatly, greatly advanced by drive from the White House. I mean, one of the great things that President Obama did, you know, he, he announced the climate, his climate action plan in, in uh, June or so of 2013. And after, not right away, but after a few months, he brought John Podesta, who was my original mentor in Washington, and President Clinton's chief of staff and a uh, very talented guy in to run the whole effort, and he ran it. I mean, so you you had you had meetings uh, at the cabinet level uh, of of all involved agencies on a regular basis, and and uh, at at the level of uh, you know talking about adaptation and other issues that they were um, that that needed to be driven. So I think that that given the orientation of this administration right now, I would be worried about the extent to which there was going to be a lot of forward motion on, uh, on that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> a lot of effort is going into a lot of uh, planning at this point in time on, on vulnerability assessments and uh, adaptation. I'm on, I didn't hear what you said. Vulnerability. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'm wondering, at some point in time, we're going to have to start implementing plans, uh, resiliency plans and adaptation plans. Do you have any creative ideas of how we're going to fund all this work? Uh, do I have, no, I don't have creative plans about, uh, about, uh, about funding per se. I mean, there, there, there was very important work, uh, done in the, uh, adaptation, uh, I forget what number, uh, but it was, it was a, it, it was the national assessment, might have been the third, but in any event that, that came out, uh, a few years ago during the Obama years, and that's, uh, an extraordinarily, uh, good document which uh, which goes region by region and area by area and talks about exactly what are the sorts of, of stresses and adaptation problems those areas whether it's New England or the west or the or the south uh, need to face um, you know fine I mean I think the financing question is is, is uh, I, I don't have any I don't have any special um, special insight on that it's it's but it's I mean, I think the more we see the kinds of problems that we're seeing all over the country in terms of, of impacts, and the more there's going to be uh, a sense of the need for state governments and local governments to prioritize the actions that are going to essentially keep people safe. So I think there's going to be a stronger and stronger argument to prioritize funds that exist uh, in terms of getting more funds. You know, it's the, it, that, that's an age-old question. I th okay, great. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.